Welcome to Centennial United Methodist Church, our Roseville campus, for our worship online this day. This is the first Sunday after Easter, and you will feel the resurrection wave and spirit throughout our service today. I invite you to join with me now as we read responsively our call to worship. We need your presence on the long road, Lord, the road between fear and hope. The road between the place where all is lost and the place of resurrection. Like the disciples walking the road to Emmaus, we are in need of your company. Jesus, stand among us in your risen power. Let this time of worship be a hallowed hour. from later on, on the first Easter, from Luke chapter 24. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, And when they did not find his body there, 
they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. Hello, boys and girls. I am so glad to see you today. For our song, we are going to sing one of my very favorites that I learned many years ago when I was your age. So all of the girls and the women, I'd like you to sing with me, and our part is hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Let's try that. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. And for us guys, the boys, we all sing praise ye the Lord. Excellent. Let's give it a try together. So now we're going to try it again. You've got it flowing in you. This time, either jump out of your seats and stand up tall and sing your part, or wave your hands way up high when you sing your part. Let's try it. In our scripture reading today, a couple disciples are with Jesus and they are going for a seven mile walk. They're on their way home. And so since we're doing virtual worship and we are recording, I thought, why not take advantage of it and go for a walk together today? In our story, as the disciples are walking along, they're talking with Jesus, who they don't understand or recognize as Jesus. And they're talking about all these things that have happened to Jesus in what we call Holy Week, this last week before Jesus, has di Jesus died and then rose again. Well, what I love is the kindness and the grace that Jesus extends to these disciples. He doesn't ask them, where were you on that Easter morning? Why weren't you with the women who brought spices to care for my body? He doesn't ask them, where are you going now that you've heard news that Jesus is alive? He offers them grace and kindness, which is an incredible thing that Jesus offers to each of us. We get to make choices each and every day. Do we go down this path or this path? With our words, with our actions, with the grace and the kindness that we extend to others. We can live just like Jesus in all of the choices that we have each day. What a wonderful blessing that is. Let's pray together. Gracious and holy God, thank you for your amazing creation. Thank you for your amazing life that offers us a guide. Help us, Lord, to walk graciously and kindly in all the decisions we make. Amen. We continue reading from Luke. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. 
But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here ends the reading. God, God give, give me, me courage, courage to, to live, live my, my life, life on, on the path, path you have set, set before me, me guided, guided by, by your, your word. word. Amen. Amen. I invite you to pray with me. Oh God, out of all the words which are spoken today, out of all the words which are sung, out of all the words which are heard, May it be your living word that remains and abides with us, that sticks with us and gives us life and life eternal. In the name of the Christ and in the Holy Spirit, we pray and let everyone say, Amen. The road to Emmaus. What roads do you love in your life? I love the wide open roads from here in the Twin Cities to Portland, Oregon, where our daughter and her husband live. I love the wide open plains of North Dakota and then the Rocky Mountains of Montana and Idaho and then the Columbia River Gorge of Oregon. I love the streets of Berlin where our son lives, the wide open Unter den Linden leading to the grand Brandenburg Gate where Ronald Reagan challenged totalitarian thugs. I love the unassuming street where Dietrich Bonhoeffer was arrested. I love the streets that our son loves with all their little markets and concert spaces and museums. I love the roads that take me home after a long day's work, a long week's work, a long year's work. Think about the roads in your life. The road that maybe led you to your dream job, the street that led you to meeting the love of your life, the road to a decision point in your life. To the two disciples in our scripture from Luke's gospel today, the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus seemed to be a road, but it was there on that first Easter evening that the risen Christ encountered them. I, found, I find that this Emmaus Road Easter passage has a real resonance with me. There are several reasons why, and I want to share just a few of them with you today. Maybe it has a resonance for you as well. First, this scripture story takes place on just a road. And that means that no road need ever be just a road again. In our scripture today, for all the two disciples on the road to Emmaus knew, Jesus was dead as a doornail. The party was over. Yes, there had been reports of angels announcing the resurrection. There was an empty tomb, but no risen Christ to their knowledge. Yes, it was just a road that they took back home to Emmaus. And then a stranger joins them on their journey. A stranger joins us on our journeys too. I say stranger because we may not always recognize the risen Christ along the roads we travel in our lives, but he comes just the same. Are we paying attention? 
The poet Emily Dickinson once said that the only commandment she never broke was consider the lilies. Consider the lilies. Pay attention to them. Mull over them. Meditate on them. Gaze upon them. It has indeed been said that the first rule of spiritual awakening is observe. Pay attention. One of the questions I like to ask small groups is, where have you seen God in your life lately? Maybe it's especially good for Minnesotans to be asked that question, since sometimes we play things way too close to the vest. I remember this woman who joined our church out on Lake Minnetonka. She had moved in from the south somewhere, and she said, you know, it's hard to get to know you Minnesotans. I love you all, but you just don't put yourself out there. And I'm just not used to that. I'm from the south, she said. And she became a leader in our church, and she helped us to see ourselves and get out of our shells just a little bit better. Yes, it's good to put ourselves out there more. Do you have a place where you can ask and be asked, where have you seen God in your life lately? Maybe God has shown up when you need a second wind. Maybe God has shown up as you hear bullfrogs starting to make their joyful noises in the spring. Maybe God has shown up as you've paid more attention to people on the margins of our society, but rest assured they're not on the margins of God's attention. Where have you seen God in your life lately? The stranger of the Emmaus Road joins us on our roads, bringing new life in ways we otherwise would miss. A second reason this Emmaus Road passage resonates with me is that on this road, the two disciples are pitching things back and forth. Pitching things back and forth. When this stranger joins them on the road, he asks, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along? And the Greek word of the original New Testament here is instructive. It is anabalo, which literally means to pitch back and forth. Balo means to throw, to pitch, to catch, to cast. So antibalo literally means to pitch back and forth. What are these things you are pitching back and forth to each other as you walk along? The stranger asks them. Are you pitching things back and forth with God? That's a way to think about prayer. Notice that that is what the two disciples now start to do with this stranger on the road to Emmaus. The risen Christ incognito to the two disciples asks them what they are talking about as they walk along and they stand still looking sad. Then they tell him the story of Jesus' death saying, we had hoped... Are there sadder words in all of Scripture? We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. We had hoped that he was the Messiah. We had hoped that he was the Christ. And what does this stranger do? He listens to them. He responds to them. They pitch things back and forth. All too often we think that God doesn't want to hear our sadness, our anger, our fear, our disappointment, our frustration. Somehow we maybe think that God isn't big enough to handle all of this, especially our anger, or that God isn't interested, or that God is too pure to be able to handle raw human emotions. But the Creator made us with the capacity for deep emotion. 
Look at the Psalms. The Psalm writers were emotionally real with God. The Psalm writers could pitch things back and forth with God. That's prayer. We hear the psalmist's praise, yes. Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. We hear their trust in God, yes. God is our refuge in us and our strength, a very present help in time of trouble. But we also hear their gut level, fear of enemies. The psalmist says, they track me down, now they surround me, they set their eyes to cast me to the ground. We also hear the psalmist's voice, anger and forsakenness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but find no rest. Yes, we can be emotionally real with God. Yes, we can pitch things back and forth with God. Yes, the Risen Christ, this stranger, listened to the disciples' disappointment and sorrow and spoke with them on the Emmaus Road. A third reason I resonate with this Emmaus story is the graciousness of this stranger. The graciousness of this stranger when they get to the village The risen Christ, still incognito to them, does not impose himself on them. It is only, it is only when they urge him to stay with them for the night that he comes into their home. There's a gentleness there. There's a deep kindness there. Christ does not force his way into our lives either. He waits for us to invite him. And I pray that all we do here at this church called Centennial or in whatever church you're a part of or spiritual community that you're a part of, I pray that all that we do here at Centennial in worship, in small groups, in children's classes, in youth groups, in the way we talk to and the way we talk about each other, in the way we passionately talk about issues of race and poverty and class and sexual orientation and gender identity, I pray that all of this will reflect the love of truth and the respect for people and the graciousness that Jesus had. Graciousness. E. Stanley Jones was a world-famous Methodist missionary in India. Basically, I suppose, back in the 30s and 40s. And he told of one time about a situation where the, his fellow members of the ashram helped him out with a spiritual problem. It seems that for a number of years, E. Stanley Jones had supported a particular public leader financially. And when the time came that E. Stanley Jones could no longer support this man financially, the man turned on Jones and attacked him in the press. Sounds like social media, doesn't it? But this was the social media of the 1930s and 40s. So E. Stanley Jones sat down and wrote a reply of a few sentences. It was the kind of reply in which you don't give your opponent a leg to stand on. As he put it, it's the kind of reply you are proud of the first five minutes, the second five minutes you're not so certain, and the third five minutes you know you're wrong. Before he mailed this letter, today before, we'd say, before he pressed send, before he mailed this letter, he sent it to the people in his ashram, in his spiritual community, to get their opinion of it. They sent it back with three words written in the margin, not sufficiently redemptive. 
E. Stanley Jones was devastated. He knew that he was winning the argument but losing the person. So he tore up the letter and said, Lord, you're just going to have to take care of my reputation. And a few weeks later, he received a letter of apology from the man who had turned on him so publicly. Our culture, especially email and social media, especially because so often we can submit things anonymously, our culture teaches us to get back at the other person, to look out only for number one. May we instead learn the graciousness of Jesus Christ, the beloved community of all races that Martin Luther King talked about is not just a goal off in the future. It is meant to be lived here, however imperfectly. The end matters and the means matter in the beloved community and in the ways of God. Fourth and finally, how do the two disciples finally recognize this stranger? They're in the house together, and Luke tells us when he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Could it be the hands that gave Jesus away? Hands breaking the bread in such a familiar way. When you take communion, remember, this is an Emmaus meal. This is a resurrection meal. So be it. Amen and amen. Will you please join me in our affirmation of faith? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and to serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, in life, in death, 
In life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen. You'll be hearing a virtual choir singing a place at the table in just a moment as we give of our offering. Please know that there's a place at God's table for you in the church of God, in the heart of God. And now I invite you to give of your prayers and presence and gifts and service and witness as we're part of the resurrection community called the Christian Church. The flowers on the altar today are for A.J. Sheridan's mother, Lori, Pastor Whitney's mother-in-law, who passed away on March 20th, 2021, after three, a three-year battle with cancer. A second flower is for longtime Centennial member Alice Ann Erickson, who passed away February 20th, 2021. Alice Ann is the wife of James Erickson. The third flower is for Centennial member Esther Schneider, Schneider, who passed away March 31st, 2021. Esther was very active in our Rares senior group with her husband, Dave, who's deceased as well. Esther is the mother of Katie and Dan Schneider, Brian. A celebration of her life will be held sometime this summer in Fairbolt. Will you continue to pray with me? Holy God, in life we journey with you. We journey with our families and friends and with those who we meet day by day. 
May we be to you and to them good companions. Help us to put our best foot forward firmly on the path that you would have us walk. Help us not to put our feet in our mouths or to step on one another's toes along the way. We may not always understand it or acknowledge it, but we have many other companions who walk with us. People we may never meet, but that we share this world of yours with. Help us to remember them as we travel along making our choices each day. May our choices do no harm and offer opportunity and love to our world companions. Help us to be mindful of the impact that we can have on the lives of people elsewhere in our purchasing, in our using natural resources, in our stewardship of your creation. Make our choices good ones, choices that do no harm and offer opportunity and love to our world companions. Holy God, guide those in leadership positions to walk the walk as well as talk the talk. Help them make wise choices, ones that do no harm and offer opportunity and love to our world companions. As we walk this journey called life, we do not walk alone, for you are always, always with us. Hear us, Lord, as we continue to pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you can see, the prayer shawl ministry has been quite prolific during the pandemic. The Centennial Prayer Shawl Ministry began in 2005 as a way to reach out to struggling members with love and compassion. Our shawls were given to others also, so as an outreach, we began sewing a label onto the shawl to identify Centennial as the provider. Small cards were also attached with the knitter's names, a blank line for the recipient's name, and a short prayer. The prayer shawl members knit various types of shawls a triangular shape to drape over the shoulders, a short square or rectangular for the lap, and a long version for covering the entire body. Whatever pattern is used tries to be worked in multiples of three to symbolize the Holy Trinity. I'll never forget visiting Jean Topitzhofer at Ling Bloomston and seeing his shawl covering his entire body from the bottom of his chin all the way down to his tippy toes. Baptismal shawls are also created by the ministry. Leftover yarn is used to make preemie caps, which are then given to the newborn intensive care unit at Masonic Children's Hospital in Minneapolis. Our shawls are given to those who are grieving, healing from surgery or other medical conditions, residents of long-term care facilities, graduating high school seniors, and newborn babies. Over the years, more than 322 have been delivered. The shawls have not only comforted those locally, but have traveled to Indiana, Arizona, and even California. A few comments to share from shawl recipients. I am touched to be a recipient of a precious prayer shawl, lovely, delicate artwork by Betty Dillon. Thank you and members of your church for the beautiful prayer shawl sent to Don recently. He spends his days covered with it. Our deepest thanks for the kind words, prayer of comfort, and the shawl. It is so beautiful, soft, and truly comforting. I wrap it around me in those extremely sad moments, and it helps me more than you know. Or as I walk by and see it on my chair, 
I'm reminded of your care and friendship. Would you pray with me as we bless these prayer shawls? O God of love, who wraps your people round with your care and concern and grace, we stand in the midst of holiness. We stand in the midst of holy love. We know the love, the attention to detail, the particularity that's gone into each stitch of these prayer shawls. And we ask you, O Holy One, to bless each one. More than that, O God, we ask you to bless those who will wear these, those who will be covered by them in their tears, in their anguish, in their struggles, in their pain, in their dreams for the future, in their living in the moment, in their memories, in the circles of love which they know from family and friends and from their brothers and sisters and siblings in Christ from the church. We pray that they will feel themselves surrounded by your love and care. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, who is our good shepherd. And let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Friends, go forth on this journey with God to love and serve your neighbors in all that you do. Go forth in peace. <laughs>